بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وتقا وعملا يا أرحم الراحمين فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار فأما بعد Last week we were discussing events that occurred during the life of Ibrahim عليه السلام and Ibrahim alayhi salam was contemporary to some of the other prophets. Among them was Prophet Lut alayhi salam, Prophet Lut. And we've discussed about Lut's immigration into the city of Sadum, which is one of around seven cities alongside the Jordanian River, to, uh, specifically in the Dead Sea today. Okay. And we have discussed what Lut has faced there and the uh, struggle he has faced with those people because of their acts. And then we moved forward into Ismail alayhi salam and his birth. And we talked about Hajar's struggle in Mecca and then how she discovered Zamzam. And then we stopped talking about we stopped when we were talking about about Ismail growing up in Mecca. All right. So, inshallah, let's recap on the map certain things. Okay. This is a better map. This is larger, more specific. Okay, Bismillah. So here we can see uh, parts of what is, what is known today as the Middle East region. Um, Adam alayhi salam, when he descended into, can you see the person? Yeah. When he descended into um, earth from heavens, he came to Mecca. Mecca is around here, okay? And he met with uh, Hawa alayhi, alayhi salam on Jabal Arafah. On Jabal Arafah. We all know Jabal Arafah, right? The mount, we do Hajj. When we do Hajj, we go and climb th that mountain. Okay. So after that, Adam had Qabil and Habil. And they say that Qabil killed Habil in the city of uh, Zabadani, which is in Syria, so around here. And then he had Shaykh, and they say that Shaykh lived around in Bilad al-Sham as well, so in Syria, Palestine, so here. And then Qabil, Qabil's descendants lived in uh, the Suhul. So... We can say also around Iraq. So after that, we had Idris. The people moved into Babylon. Where is Babel? Babel is over here. Near Iraq. Uh, near, sorry, Baghdad. In Iraq. Today, Iraq. Idris moved into Egypt. Egypt is here. And Idris established the first writing system. The first script, right? And then Idris established a kingdom, all right? And then he went into war with the people here. And then he controlled this area. And then we have Nuh getting raised in this area as well, in Babel. In Babel. And then after that, the Tufan happened, the flood. And Nuh alayhi salam, his ark stopped at Al-Judi in northern 
Syria today. Okay? And after that, Nuh, uh, Nuh's children spread all around the world. Yafet and his descendants went across the sea into Europe. And then Sam went into Syria, Damascus, established the city of Damascus, traveled all the way into Mecca, and then traveled all the way into Yemen, established the city of Sana'a, and lived in Yemen. Some of his descendants lived in what is known as Al-Ahqaf, between Oman and Yemen, in Hadramaut. Okay? And then um, the descendants of Ham went into Africa and lived in Africa. Great? And then we talked about Ad, who were in Al-Ahqaf, in Yemen. And then how, after uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his punishment upon them, Hud traveled into Hadramaut, so lived around here. And then he had two children. He had Qahtan and another child. In Hebrew, that child is called Falag, which comes from the Arabic root Falag. Falag means Qasim, so his name was Qasim. So Qasim went into the Arabian Peninsula, northern of the other Arabian Peninsula, and lived around here. All right? And then his descendants lived in Iraq. So remember Babel? Namrud would become the king of Babel, and then he would become the king of the known world. His brother, as reports claim, he would be the king of Egypt, and Ibrahim would be born in Babel. And after that, he would move into Or, and then he would go back to Babel. And from Babel, he would go up there into Haran, near the Judea. And from Haran, he goes into Halab. And from Halab, he goes into Damascus. And then he goes and lives in Palestine, in Bir Sabah. And then from Bir Sabah, he goes into Egypt. And he meets with the king of Egypt. We know, we talked about the story. And then there, he, with Lut, returns back into Palestine. Okay, now here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Lut that he is a prophet and he has to go to the people of Sadum in order to preach for them to stop doing the actions they're doing and also to preach for them to uh, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he went into this area, Sadum, in the Dead Sea. Lut was there. And we've discussed about the actions and where they are derived from and how they are rituals that Namrud forced upon the people who are living in all of this area in order for them to get, to get closer to the shaitan because they were worshipping idols to get closer into the shaitan. Great. All right. And then, Ibrahim with Hajar, they traveled all the way back into Mecca. So do we see a kind of connection here? Right? Do we see this repetitive route? How the ancestors of Ibrahim went through the same places? And Arabic, Arabs, Ismail would be the father of Arabs, right? Ismail's father is Kildani, Chaldean. And his mother is Egyptian. And Arabic, Arabic's root, the people of Babel, before Nuh, they would live in where? In Iraq, in Chaldea, what is, what is going to become Chaldea. And the writing system of Arabic is derived from the writing system made by Idris, alayhi salam, in Egypt. So do we see this repetitive root? So Arabic, the Arabic language is, was spoken in Chaldea, and then the writing system was made in Egypt. And the father of the uh, Adnani Arabs, Urbanu Ismail, he's half Chaldean and half Egyptian. SubhanAllah. So do we see this? All right. Okay, so Ibrahim alayhi salam would go back then into Palestine. Oops. Would go back then into Palestine. And then Ismail would live in Palestine. And from here, from Yemen, a tribe called Jurhum would come here. So we have Jurhum al-Ula and we have Jurhum al thaniya The first Jurhum and the second Jurhum. Jurhum al-Ula, 
They were the um, descendants of Lawith, Lawith ibn uh, Sam ibn Nuh. Lawith, he had Tasam Jadis, La, uh, Tasam Jadis, Jurhum, wa Imliq. From Imliq comes Al Kanaaniyun, Al Hiksos, Al Amuriyun. So from Imliq comes the rulers of Palestine, Kanaan. The rulers of Lebanon and Carthage and Tunis, Phoenician, the the rulers of uh, Egypt, early Egypt, Hyksos, and Hajar would be also either Hyksos or Amuria. In most reports, she is Amuria, Amuriyun from the Amuriyun. So she is also descended from Iram. So. This is Jurhum al-Ula. Now Ismail met with Jurhum al-Thaniya, the second Jurhum. The second Jurhum descend from Saba, who is a descendant of Yashjib, who is a descendant of Ya'rib, who is a descendant of, who is a, the son of Qahtan, the son of Hud. So we need to distinguish between Jurhum al-Ula and Jurhum al-Thaniya. Much, pretty much like there is Ad al-Ula and Ad al-Thaniya. Ad al-Ula, the descendants of Iram. Adathania comes later. The people who are descendant from Hud, Adathania. Okay. And here we, we see the, the family connection. So Nahur is the grandfather of Ibrahim. Nahur ibn, uh, uh, ibn Sarugh ibn uh, Nahur ibn Sarugh ibn Rago, Rago or Rago, and then Ibn uh, Matoshlach. Ibn uh, Abir, Ibn, sorry, Ibn Qasim, Ibn Abir or Hud, Ibn Sam, Ibn Shalikh, Ibn Sam, Ibn Nuh. Nahur would be the grandfather the, uh, father of Ibrahim. We have another Nahur, the brother of Ibrahim. We have two Harans. Haran, the uncle of Ibrahim, who built the city of Haran. And Haran, the brother of Ibrahim. Haran, the brother of Ibrahim, was the father of Lut. So Lut is the nephew of Ibrahim. And Ibrahim would marry his cousin, Sarah. And his brother, Nahur, would marry also his cousin, Malka. And Ibrahim then would marry four people in his life. He would marry Haj Hajar. Marry ha Hajar. From Hajar comes Ismail. So, so we said Hajar descends from Aram, from Imliq. But she was an Egyptian princess. So uh, the people uh, from Imliq ruled over Egypt. And she was a princess. She was the brother uh, of, uh, reports say, Sanusarit, Sanusarist, one of the pharaohs or kings of Egypt. And then the Hexos would come and invade. So another Imliq tribe would come and invade Egypt. And they would kick out uh, the, the uh, ruling family. And they would kill the men and would take the women and enslave the women. So Hajar was a princess enslaved by the invading Hexos. So the man who met Ibrahim, the king of Egypt, he was, a Hex, uh, he was from the tribe of Hexos. Sarah, they also report that she was a princess. Her father built Harran, he became the king of Harran, and Sarah is the princess of Harran, leaving her people because she was not content with the way they were worshipping idols and stars and the devil and so on. So she met with her cousin Ibrahim, who was preaching for the da'wah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so she followed Ibrahim alayhi salam. And from her he bore Ishaq. Ishaq, who we will talk about his children later on. And then so, uh, he would, Ibrahim would marry Qantura. Qantura is Kan'aniya, so she's also from the tribe of Iram, but uh, from Imliq, but Kan'aniya, native to Palestine. And from her, he would have Median, Saraj, Zumran, Yaqshan, and Nashaq, and there's a sixth child, they did not get his name. Uh, Median would be the uh, ancestor of Shu'aib, we know the prophet Shu'aib, right? He would be the ancestor of Shu'aib, who was Arab. Now he would also marry Hajun, who's also Kan'aniya. And from her, he, he has Kaysan, Sa, uh, Sauraj, Umaym, Lutan, Nufay, Nafis. All of these tribes, all of these people and their descendants would form tribes and then they would become kings of the Arabian Peninsula and Iraq and Sham and Egypt. 
Thus, they would be all Arabs, but speaking different dialects of Arabic. So this is how I put it. So back then, we had different dialects of Arabic. We had the uh, Chaldean Arabic. We had the Egyptian Arabic, back then the ancient Egyptian Arabic. We had the um, Akkadian, the Assyrian, and so on. Great. Now, Assyria, in Arabic or in native Assyrian, it's called Ashur. Ashur, because they descend from Ashur, the son of Sam. Ashur. And Ashur, they would invade this land and they would have a kingdom. This is later on. And then they would call this land Ashuria, the land of Iraq, Syria, um, Lib Lib Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, Sina in Egypt, parts of Turkey, parts of Iran, parts of northern Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. All of this land would be invaded by Assyria. They would have a huge kingdom, very strong kingdom called the Assyrian kingdom and would rule them Ashur Banibal. So they called it Ashuria. Now later on, the Greeks would invade this land. Alexander the Great, al iskandar al-Maqdani. It's important because today we're gonna talk about al iskandar because of a confusion uh, many Muslims have. So bear with me. So Alexander the Great would invade this land and then he would establish his Macedonian empire and he would rule over this land. Now in Greek and in Roman and those European language or Indo-European languages, they would say Asuria because they don't have the sheen. Do you see the alphabet of Latin? A, B, C, D, etc. A, B, C, D. C used to be pronounced G in Latin, not C. So it would be abjad derived from the Arabic or Semite uh, alphabet, right? Abjad hawiz hitti kalamun. So notice in English, for instance, A, B, C, D, abjad, and then E, F, G, E, they would not know how to pronounce the ha, so they would say ha, e, not ha, e. So instead of saying hawiz, they would say awiz. And then the wow, they would say it with V, so it would be ivviz. So it would be EVZ. And then the Germanic tribe was, tribes, because English is a Germanic language, it's not, it's not Latin language, by the way. So they would say EFAS. So it would become EF. And then Z, they would get rid of it and move it forward because they would have the letter G. But they already had G as a C. So all of this confusion would come later from tongues mixing. So... So S, later on, in, in the Arabic alphabet, old um, organization would be Abjad Hawwiz Hitti Kalamun Sa'afasa Qarashat Thakhada Dadaqa Qarashat, Qarashat, right? Sheen. What is it in English? Q-R-S-T, Qarashat. Q is the co uh, equivalent of Qaf, Q, Qarashat. So they would not say Sheen, they would say S. And this is also in the Greek alphabet. Instead of a uh, sort of a sheen, they say uh, sigma, S. So they would come into this land, and instead of saying Ashuria, they say Asuria. Asuria. And then it, it would start getting cha changing, start getting cha to change, and they would say Assyria. And so them and the Persians, after Alexander's death, they would divide their kingdoms. So we have Ptolemy in Egypt, and then Seleucid in Persia, and Seleucid would rule over this land. So he would divide those provinces, and then he would say, well, this part, which is nowadays Iraq, he would say this northern part of this place would be called Assyria, and then there we would say Syria, without A, Syria, all right? So what do we say to, you know Syria, right? Syria, the modern country. So what do we call the people of Syria? Syrian, Syrians, right? So this is what they would say there. Now, remember how we said that Syr uh, not Syria, um, Chaldean or Assyrian, those languages there, they were all dialects of Arabic. Hebrew is a dialect of Arabic back then. So people, pretty much like Egy Egyptian dialect today or Syrian and Khaliji dialect, right? 
they would understand each other, but through time, they would start borrowing words from Latin, from Greek, from Egyptian, and they would have their own weird collection, right? So I will give you this example. Let's get an American person who does not understand Arabic, and let's get Egypt an Egyptian, and let's get a Syrian, and let's get someone from Kuwait, great? And this, this American guy who does not understand Arabic, he would sit there, and then he would say, well, you guys teach me Arabic. So he, he would start with the Egyptian, for instance, and then he would tell him, teach me how to say hi, how are you? So the Egyptian says, uh, Salamu alaykum zayyak. Right? This is how they say it in the Egyptian dialect. And then the uh, Syrian would tell him, Marhaba kifak. And then the Kuwaiti would say, Hala shlonik. Are these words similar? Zayak, kifak, shlonik. All of them means one thing. How are you? In the modern dialects we have. But in Arabic, it's kayfa haluk in the Ismail Arabic and Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu in the Quran Arabic, Al Arabiya, Al Mubin, Al Fusha. It's kayfa haluk. So back then, Alexander and the Greeks and the Romans, when they invaded this land, they would hear the Assyrians say it in a different way. And then the Chaldeans would say it in a different way. And then the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula would say it a different way. The Egyptians would say it a different way. Hebrew would say it a different way. Right? Like in Hebrew, it's mashlomach. Uh, right? Mashlomach, which means how are you? So they would get confused. They think that this is a separate language. Thus, they would call it Hebrew language, not the Hebrew dialect. Right? And so, the Chaldeans and Assyrians and all of these people of Iraq and Syria, they had a very, very close dialect to each other. And Akkadian, all of these languages. So, they would genera generalize. So, once they hear it, they would say, oh, this is Syrian. This is Syrian. Syrian language. And th now, the Arabs who lived there, they would hear the Romans who invaded, and the Greeks who invaded this land, they would hear them say, Syrians. So the Arabs would say, Innahum Syrian, Syriani. Thus comes the English, lang the English name of uh, the language Syriac, Syriac, Syriania. This is, this is its root, Syriani. And so, th this is the, the, uh, the mixture of tongues among nations and how it changes everything. But you would see that everything just comes back together and that Chaldeans and Assyrians and Hebrew, they're all just one nation. They're all Arabs eventually because they descend from Hud, who spoke Arabic. But do you see how those the invaders, because they misunderstood you, they said, well, this is a different language. This is the same with Africa or in Eastern Asia. They had very close, uh, you know, la uh, very close languages, but just different dialects. But then because the foreigners would not understand it, they would say this is a separate language because they would not understand it. Because among us today, nowadays in the Arab world, I would understand what an Egyptian person would speak in his dialect or a Kuwaiti person, right? But a foreigner would not differentiate. And we had this questions millions of times. When, when they ask me, for instance, where are you from? I say, I'm from Syria, but uh, I lived in Kuwait. And they're like, oh, so do you, do you guys understand each other? Like Kuwaitis and Syrians, do you guys understand each other? And I'm like, yeah, we speak Arabic. <laughs> and they're like, are you sure? Because you guys, they say different words. And, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's just different dialects. <laughs> so for them, they like maybe 100 years from now, if we don't get back to use, using the Arabic language, the Fusha language, after 100 years, some, some American guy or Western or Russian or whatever foreigner who does not understand Arabic as his native language, he would think he's very smart and he discovered something. He would say, oh, this is the Kuwaiti language. <laughs> and then we would have more divisions. <laughs> Great. All right, so back into the topic. This is how all of them are the same tribes as we can see. They're all descended from Ibrahim and who is a descendant from Hud. Okay, so after Ismail or after Ismail grew up in Mecca, 
He had his father's Chaldean dialect and his mother Egyptian dialect, Irami dialect, and he would mix them with the Jurhum dialect, the Yemeni dialect, and he would get the purest Arabic dialect, the original Arabic dialect that Adam spoke in heaven. The Al Arabiya Al Mubina, Al Fusha. Al Lugh Al Fusha, Al Arabiya Al Mubina. Right? The, the Quran that we read with, Bilisani Quraysh, this is Al Arabiya Al Fusha, the, the tongue of Ismail. Now let's fast forward 13 years after Ismail and after the whole thing that happened in Mecca, Ishaq. So Ishaq would be born after Ismail, 13 years after Ismail, 13 years. How, the, how does the incident go? Ibrahim alayhi salam and Sarah lived in their town in, in Kanaan between the city of Iliya or Al-Quds and Bir Sabah. There, they used to have a lot of guests. Suddenly, they stopped getting any guests. For, they say, some sources say that for 15 years, they don't get any guests. So one day, three men, very handsome, very beautiful, with a, like, Lovely manners, they approach Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this in the Quran, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim bismillahi rahman rahim Hal ataka hadithu dhayfi Ibrahim al-mukramin Ith dakhalu alayhi faqalu salaman Qala salamun qawmun munkaroon فراغ إلى أهله فجاء بعجل سمين فقربه إليهم قال ألا تأكلون فأوجس منهم خيفة قالوا لا تخف وبشروه بغلام عليم فأقبلت امرأته في صرة فصكت وجهها وقالت عجوز عقيم قالوا كذلك قال ربك إنه هو الحكيم العليم So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in this ayat? Has there reached you the story of the honored guests of Ibrahim? The honored guests of Ibrahim, the angels. When they entered upon him and said, We greet you with peace. Salam. He answered, And upon you peace. Wa alaykum salam. You are a people unknown. I don't know you. I've, this is the first time I've seen you, but welcome. We don't have guests. We've never had guests for, for years. Please, welcome. Then he went to his family and came with a fat roasted calf. So he grabbed a calf. Ajil. And then... It was a very fat ijal because remember when he came back from Egypt, he became rich, right? He had sheep and money. He was given this by the, the Egyptian king because the Egyptian king was scared from Sarah, right? So he had a lot of money and a lot of sheep. So he got the fattest sheep and then he grilled the, that sheep. He roasted it and placed it near them. And he said, will you not eat? And he filled from them apprehension they said fear not and gave him good tidings of a learned boy and his wife approached with a cry of alarm and struck her face and said i am a barren old woman they said thus has said your lord indeed he is the wise the knowing all right so they would come to him approach him three people Ibra uh, uh, jibrail jibril israfi and mikael it would come in in uh, the uh, the form of a very handsome uh, uh, men with uh, lovely manners and they would approach Ibrahim and say assalamu alaikum to him tahiyyatuhum fiha salam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the, uh, the greetings of Muslims is salam and Ibrahim he was a Muslim ma kana yahudiyan wala nasraniyan wala kan hanifan musliman he was not a Christian he was not a Jew he was Muslim hanif Muslim so he would say his, his greeting is salam same thing in Hebrew they say shalom which means salam, peace. This is how you see origins of religion is Islam. Inna deen عند الله Islam. So they would say salamun alaykum and he would say wa alaykum as salam. Ibrahim would respond by his, back. He would say wa alaykum as salam. In 
You guys are unknown to me. I've never seen you before. You're strangers. But welcome. Salamun alaykum. And so he would go to his family and he would get the calf and he would roast it and he would prepare it and then he would put it in front of them. And then he would notice them. They're not eating the calf. So that's something strange. You know, uh, Arabs manners and generosity that they would get the best among their uh, property, you know, best calf or best uh, camel, and then they would give it to their guests. So they would respect, uh, they would ex expect the guests respectively to eat from it, right? This is this is how the manners uh, were like, or the tradition where it was like. But this was this was a weird situation for him because this not happened. Did not happened. They did not eat from it. So he looked at them and he feared them. He said, "You know, there's something wrong with these guys. I'm, I don't, I'm, uh, I don't have hope. I, I'm, and I'm mutafail. I'm scared. I'm terrified. So, of course, because they're angels, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed to them that he is terrified. So calm him down, all right? <laughs> Before he he's he gets really scared. So they said, "Fear not. Don't don't be scared. All right? We're the messengers of Allah. We were sent by Allah because." Uh, we are going to tell you that you're going to have a child. All right, so Sarah hears this. So she leaves everything in her hand and then she's like, okay, no, wait, what did I just hear? They're joking, right? So <laughs> she goes to them and she closes her face. She hides her face, right? Respect and manner. In Adina and Allah Islam. In Islam, a woman has to be respectful. She has to respect herself, her body. So she covers herself so she covered herself she covered her head she covered her face all right and then she went to those angels she did not know they were angels so she said am i going to get a child and i'm unfertile i can't bear childs so she she has reached the the age of her stopping the cycle her cycle so she can't she can't get pregnant anymore and her husband ibrahim alayhi salam is an old man so she says He's an old man, a 90 years old man, and I am a person who is unfertile. I can't b get pregnant anymore. How is this possible? So they tell her, thus has said your Lord. Indeed, he is the wise, the knowing. هَكَذَا قَالَ رَبُّكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لديه الحكمة, لديه الخبرة, لديه القدرة. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all the power, all the mighty. Don't, don't question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كُنْ فَيَكُونَ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. All right? So of course because they had faith May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Let us have at least just one half of their faith They said okay Allah said Allah said So after this incident Ibrahim became very happy And Sarah became very happy Because Ibrahim really loved Sarah She's his first wife and So he really loved her so he's going to have a child from her. And Sarah became happy. She's going to have a child. She's not jealous from Hajar anymore. I have a child now. <laughs> right? So he bows to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yasjud lillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh, thank you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have let me leave Ismail. And I don't know what has come from him. He probably died with Hajar. And you have ex exchanged uh, Ismail for me with Another child, Ishaq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the ayah also, وَمِنْ وَرَاءِ إِسْحَاقَ Yaqub In another uh, verse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that he's going to have a son, Ishaq. And from that son, he's going to have a grandson, Yaqub. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Ibrahim and says, You're welcome. You know? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates his, uh, his worshiper when he thanks him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really loves us. And he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the, the uh, harshest time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is when he takes the soul of Ibn Adam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like this time. Because he, he loves us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, arhamu ala al-abdi min ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has more mercy than the mother on her child. You know how the mother loves her child and she would literally sacrifice herself for her child. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the, his, his worshiper more than her. And he has mercy more than, uh, than her. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes, you're welcome. I gave you this gift. But here's another gift. Ismail is alive. 
I saved him. And he's going to become a great ummah, a great nation. And he's going to have 12 children. And all of these 12 children, they're going to become kings. And from Ismail, you're going to have the master of humanity. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From Ismail, you're going to have Prophet Muhammad. And when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a couple of days ago, I believe it was the... Uh, uh, they were talking about Isra and Mi'raj. It was the uh, memorial of Isra and Mi'raj. Right? Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa alladhi barakna hawla. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a night, he would take Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallu al habib. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad. He would take him from Mecca at night, in night, into Jerusalem, al Quds. And then there he would meet all of the prophets, all of the prophets, from Adam until Isa alayhi salam. And then the master of humanity, he would pray as the imam of all of the prophets. This is the level of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then after that he would, uh, he would ascend into the, uh, the heavens, the seven heavens. This is the mi'raj. In Mi'raj, they say at the seventh heaven, he met with Ibrahim alayhi salam. In Ibrahim, he was relaxing on uh, a house built just like the Kaaba, Al Bayt Al Ma'mur, in which the angels would go inside, 70,000 angels would go inside, they would do pilgrimage around this Bayt Al Ma'mur, and they, they would never. Uh, get out again It would stay worshipping Allah So Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur is another Kaaba But in heavens In the seventh sky Built for the angels to worship So Ibrahim was there He was relaxing there And worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So subhanAllah Even after he dies He still is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So The Prophet describes him Very wise man Very beautiful man When you see him You feel that you're You've just felt rel relaxation and that there's some sympathy, rahma. And so the Prophet ﷺ says that the nearest person to look like him is me. So subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ, he looks a lot like Ibrahim ﷺ. He's the nearest person to look like Ibrahim ﷺ, subhanAllah. This is the level of Ibrahim and Sayyidina Muhammad. Because if, if, now we, we as humans, we can't judge, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set each Prophet into a certain level. For us as Muslims, we love them all equally. But we say the Prophet ﷺ is Khatam al-Rusul. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are darajat, even uh, the Prophets. And Habibullah wa Khalilullah wa Khayrul Khalq, Sayyidina Muhammad Wasallam. He is the best among the Prophets. Not just the Prophets, he's the best among humankind. Wa Khayrul Alam, al Alameen. He's the best among creatures. Jinn, ins, he's the best among creatures. And who comes next after him? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Khalilullah. And we will see why. So he would see him and then he would approach him and he would say, Oh Jibreel, who's that man? So Jibreel says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, This is Jibreel. Uh, this is Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam would ask Jibreel and Jibreel would say, This is Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he would approach Ibrahim and he would say, Assalamu alaykum. And Ibrahim responds, Assalamu ala al ibn al kareem. Peace to you, my beloved son, my generous son. He tells him son because he's his, Sayyidina Muhammad he's, is his descendant. So proud of him. So, Ibrahim alayhi salam would bow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala back into the incident of Ishaq's birth. And there, he would thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would tell him that you have Ismail and from Ismail is going to come great nation the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Ishaq is going to have Ya'qub and Ya'qub is going to have Yusuf and the Asbat and from the Asbat is going to come another nation and it's going to come Musa so he tells him his descendants so Ibrahim now is extra happy he thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more so after this incident uh, happened Ibrahim walks with the angels and he says قال سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال فما خطبكم أيها المرسلون 
قالوا إنا أرسلنا إلى قوم مجرمين إلا 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 آل لوط إنا لمنجوهم أجمعين إلا امرأته قدرنا إنها لمن الغابرين So Ibrahim عليه السلام said Then what is your business here, O messengers? I mean, of course you did not descend the three of you from heavens into here just to tell me that I have a child, right? There's something behind you. And so, so they said, uh, indeed, we, we have something, we have a business. We have been sent to a people of criminals. Except the family of Lut, indeed we will save them all. Except his wife, Allah decreed that she is of those who remain behind. So Ibrahim asked them, why were you sent? There is something behind you guys, right? So they said, yes, you're right. We have sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to descend the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the people of Lut. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the people of Lut many chances. They sent him Lut. And Lut has said, uh, stop doing this disgustful act, disgusting act. You guys are, are uh, taking men and doing intercourse with them and leaving women. Stop this disgusting act. Follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them many chances, many chances, and then it comes. No more chances. So he sends the angels to descend the punishment upon them. So they say to Ibrahim alayhi salam that we are going to punish the people of Lut as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered. Now, Ibrahim alayhi salam here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what, what does he say? A'udhu bihamu shaitan rajeem. فَلَمَّا ذَهَبَ عَنْ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الرَّوْعُ وَجَاءَتْهُ الْبُشْرَى يُجَادِلُنَا فِي قَوْمِ لُوطُ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَحَلِيمٌ أَوَّاهٌ مُنِيبٌ يا إبراهيم أعرض عن هذا إنه قد جاء أمر ربك وإنهم وإنهم آتيهم عذاب غير مردود. And when the fright had left Ibrahim and the good tidings had reached him, he began to argue with us concerning the people of Lot. Indeed, Ibrahim was forbearing, grieving, and frequently returning to Allah. The angels said, O Abraham, give up this plea. Indeed, the command of your Lord has come. And indeed, there will reach them a punishment that cannot be repelled. So, do you remember when I said that the next would come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the next in Daraja would come is Ibrahim. Do you see this now? Lut, he could not stand his people. He wants them punished. You will see, you will see how, how this goes now. Nuh, he made dua on his people. Each prophet, like he would reach some sort of patience and he's like, okay, I'm done. But Ibrahim, even though a lot of chances were given to people of Lut, he would tell the angels, as reported that, uh, he would ask them, so if there was 500 believers in, in the village, would you still descend the punishment? They would say no. He said, how about 300? They would say no. He said 200, 100, until he reached around 10, and then he reached one, and they said no. And he said, well, give them more chance. Let, let them be, maybe some, some one of them would become Muslim. And they, he would leave this act and he would repent. Doesn't this case remind you about another incident when the Prophet ﷺ went to a Ta'if and then uh, Jibreel came to him and he said, لو شئت لأطبقت عليهم الأخشبين If you want it, I could get both of these mountains and just crush them with the mountains. But the Prophet ﷺ said, no, leave them. There might be at least one Muslim from them. Do you see how the resemblance to Ibrahim ﷺ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمُ إِنَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لَحَلِيمٌ أَوَّاهُ مُنِيبٌ He's patient, he's uh, forbearing, grieving, and frequently returning to Allah. And this is his high level. So inshallah, let's 
wrap it up a little bit. Let's do adhan and then we can return, okay? So Ibrahim alayhi salam keeps asking asking the angels, go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please. I, I he's he's a shafir to them. He says, Give the people of Lut more chances. Maybe at least one one Muslim would become of them. But then the angel says, This is the order of Allah. That's it. And so look at another another trait of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this. Then that's it. So Ibrahim, he gets silent. Okay, this is the order of Allah. I can't say anything. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has said so. I can't say anything. This is why Ibrahim's level is so high. So after this, the people of or uh, the angels, the three angels, they would leave Canaan and they would go and approach the city of Sadum and the Mu'tafikat. Now bear with me here, as this incident now is very very important and it will really leave you in in shock to see the and witness the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala became angry with some people what can happen قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه العزيز أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولما جاءت رسلنا لوطا سيء بهم وضاق بهم ذرعا وقال هذا يوم عصيب وجاءه قومه يهرعون إليه ومن قبل كانوا يعملون السيئات قال يا قوم هؤلاء بناتي هن أطهر لكم فاتقوا الله ولا تخزون ولا تخزون في ضيفي أليس منكم رجل رشيد قالوا لقد علمت ما لنا في بناتك من حق وإنك لتعلم ما نريد قال لو أن لي بكم قوة أو آوي إلى ركن شديد قالوا يا لوط إنا رسل ربك لن يصلوا إليك فأسر بأهلك بقطع من الليل ولا يلتفت منكم أحد إلا امرأتك إلا امرأتك إنه مصيبها ما أصابهم إن موعدهم الصبح أليس الصبح بقريب فلما جاء أمرنا جعلنا عاليها سافلها وأمطرنا عليهم حج وأمطرنا عليها حجارة من سجيل منضود مسومة عند ربك وما هي من الظالمين ببعيد. So the, tra the angels came into Lut. Great. And when our messengers, the angels came to Lut, he was anguished for them and felt for them great discomfort and said, this is a trying day. And his people came hastening to him. And before this, they had been doing evil deeds. He said, oh my people, these are my daughters. They are pure for you. So fear Allah and do not disgrace me concerning my guests. Is there not among you a man of reason? They said, you have already known that we have not concerning your daughters and claim and indeed you know what we want. He said, 
if only I had against you some power or could take refuge in a strong support. The angel said, O Lut, indeed we are messengers of your Lord. Therefore, they will never reach you. So set out with your family during a portion of the night and let not any among you look back except your wife. Indeed, she will be struck by that which strikes them. Indeed, their appointment is for the morning. Is not the morning near? So when our command came, we made the highest part of the city its lowest and rained upon them stones of layered hard clay, which were marked from your Lord and Allah's punishment is not from the wrongdoers very far. What does all of this mean? So after they left Canaan, they came to the city of Sadum. Now, two narrations for this. The first narration is that the daughters, the two daughters of Lut, remember the two daughters of Lut, Raitha and the, uh, the, the Arya, right? So the two daughters of Lut would see those three handsome men, and they're like, oh my God, this city... Number one, they rape anyone that travels to them. And number two, they do the intercourse with other men. If they see these very handsome men, they're, they're gone. So they, they go back into Lut and they say, hey, save those guys because if they see them, it's done. They're done. That's the first narration. The second narration is that they came to him while he was working in his farm and then it was he saw them, he said, oh, come to my house. If they see you, you guys are, are done. So any case, they go to his house, great? And his wife sees them. The wife of Lut is kafir, she's not Muslim. And as we said earlier, she would make fun and mock Lut with the people of Lut. So she sees them and then she, uh, the, she goes to the people, she sneaks to the people of Lut and they say, hey, she says, hey, Lot has three handsome men. Like, this is what you guys want, right? Go there. He's hiding them. And Lot, uh, the people of Lot, has told Lot that you don't get any guests. If any guests come into the city, give them to us. We, we know how to deal with them. So Lot had these guests, and they're the angels. And so they would come into the house. Here Lot says, هذا يوم عصيب. So is stating that before they came to him, when, when the wife of Lut told them, they were doing this, these disgusting intercourse. They were doing these, these actions. And they came to have them. And we said last time that in their majalis, when they're sitting in their gatherings, they, they, they do it with each other. We're not talking one on one. See how disgusting they, what, what they were doing? There is also a, a, a famous city, I think uh, 72 BC, it's called uh, Pompeii in Italy, not Mumbai. Mumbai is in India. There's Pompeii in Italy. And they used to do such things. They even did worse. They practiced wor worse types of these things with, with animals. And subhanAllah, also subhanAllah descended his punishment a volcano erupted and it made them just like stones. Till this day, you go to a museum in Pompeii in Italy nowadays and you see them, those people who lived like around 2,000 years ago, you see them stoned like this in, in the cases they were left in. Now, here, the people of Lut would want these angels, the, the three men, the three guests, because they want to do al-fahisha with them. So Lut says, he approaches them. Now, bear with me here. There is a shubha, fitna. Uh, the mustashriqeen, the, the orientalists, really, really love to uh, spread this because, you know. So they say that uh, Lut sa uh, said, قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ هَؤُلَاءِ بَنَاتِهُنَّ أَطْهَرُ لَكُمْ So they said, oh, so Lut has suggested to his people, his two daughters for adultery, just for them to leave this intercourse. This type of intercourse with Ayyad Billah al Muharram? No. Lut did not offer his da two daughters for adultery. If it could be interpreted, Lut has offered his daughters for marriage, number one. Number two, Banati, Lut meant the da uh, his daughters, my daughters, by the females of the village. So he said, instead of you guys doing this, 
just do the natural thing. This, these are, you have a lot of females. All of these females, you don't like them? There's a lot of females. Just marry one of them. He never suggests for them adultery. What, he tells them to leave uh, sin, to go to another sin? Of course not. Hasha lillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not order him that. And if he did such a thing, he would not have chosen him to be a prophet. So he, he told them, marry other females. But they said, you know, uh, it's not our right. It's not our right to, to marry females. Uh, the, the truth, the right thing to do is to have men. See, the, the mentality is corrupted. They think that the right thing is to do it with another man and the, the wrong thing is to do it with, with female. And we've seen this a lot today. I, I've, I personally read a lot of articles regarding that and how they say this, um, that from straight people comes illness. And the other acts, this is okay. This is actually protection. But HIV comes from these acts more than the straight acts. It's more because the, the orga organ that Allah Taala has created, its task is not that. Can, you, can a man get pregnant? Let's, let's be a little rational because these people tell you, if, if, you, tell them, if you tell them these words, what, what do they tell you? Oh, you're so backwards. But I tell them I'm not backwards, I'm just being rational. You guys advocate for rationality. That's not backwardness. If you say I'm backwardness because I'm being rational, then you guys are contradicting yourself. So in this case, Lot became very stressed and overwhelmed. So the angels tell him, don't fear, don't be scared. We're angels sent by Allah so they can't reach you or reach us. So don't worry. Even if they reach us, they're going to be dead. <laughs> and they gave him what is sort of like a, a material. And, and they said, throw this in their faces. And them and, and Lut threw this in the, in the faces of, of his people and they became blind. They can't see anymore. So the people of Lut said, your guests have done the same magic for us that you have done and now we can't see. We're blind. And so the angel said uh, to Lut, we have came to descend the punishment of Allah upon, your, upon these people. That's it, they're done. So Ibrahim, what did they tell the angels? Give them more chance. Do you know what Lut told them? Can you do it now? <laughs> he told them, can you do it now, please? <laughs> so, so the angel says, their, their appointment is in the morning. The morning is not far, right? It's, it's close, it's not far. And during this time, we want you to take your family, your two daughters and your wife, leave the city. And they, they told him to go into a mountain, but he said he, he, he does not like them. Lutz is fed up with them. He said, no, no, I, I, I want to be very far away from this. I'm going to go to another village. So they said, okay, as long as you're far from this. But do not look behind you. No matter what happens, no matter what you hear, do not look behind you. So Lutz says, okay. And they said, your wife is going to look, by the way, because she's a kafir. So what's going to happen to them is going to happen to her. So he said, okay. I understand that. So during the night, before, uh, during suhoor, before Fajr, he takes his family, he takes his stuff, he takes his sheep, farms, anything, anything he owns, his property, and he gets out. And some say that he went to Damascus. So he leaves. Now while on the mountain, in Jordan, you, you know the Dead Sea, right? There are mountains in, in this side of the Dead Sea. So when they were on the top of the mountain, Jibreel alayhi salam descends and then with the edge of his wing with just the edge he grabs the city the whole city do you know how large the Dead Sea is? when you see it in the map it's a large space it's a very large space so this whole area was their city so this whole area he grabbed it with the edge of his wings and he ascended it ascended it ascended it into the sky to the point that they report that they were screaming and the animals were screaming that the people on earth, in the Arabian Peninsula, they were hearing their screams. And they were screaming like, like hysterically. Imagine, imagine you're like, right now we're sitting and suddenly the, the floor just floats into the sky. What, what would you think about that? So this is what happened to them. And then this land, he flips it and crush, crushes it on the floor, on the ground, on earth. 
crushes it, just like that, and they're gone. So during all of this, the wife of Lut looks back and she said, she says, Wa qawma, oh my people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has said, he, he didn't just float their land and then flip it and crush it. No, he also has sent hijaratim and sijil, sto stones upon them. He stoned them. Stones of layered hard clay, hijaratam and sujil, the same type of stone that descended upon Abraha when he came to Mecca. And so one of the stones has reached on top of the wife of Lot, and those stones did not melt them. Instead, they became a stone. They became pillars, just like statues. And they said that each of these stones, they had the name of the person it would fall on. SubhanAllah. And if you see with me right now, on, on the projector, do you see these two pictures on the left? These two pictures, there's something standing, right? They claim that this is the wife of Lut stoned after the stone has hit her. SubhanAllah. And that Allah subhanahu ta'ala has left her as an ayah for us, to have to be to be, to learn the moral message, Subhanallah. They say that this is her. So if that's true, you're looking at the wife of Lut uh, turned into a statue after the punishment of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So back to here. This became the Jordan's river, uh, Jordan's Dead Sea, right? So anytime you go there, you find a lot of salt. This salt is from the reason of this punishment. The reason why this is the lowest place on earth, you, when, you, when, you, when you swim in the Dead Sea, you float. Naturally, it's very hard for you to, to dive in. And when you drink the water, you, you die because of the, the salt amount in it. It became a, a terrible water to drink from. All right? Because... This place was the place of the people of Lut in which the punishment of Allah Taala has descended upon. Few kilometers of this city is the city of Tel Aviv. The city of Tel Aviv, of the Zionist entity. We know this land, right? We know these people. The city of Tel Aviv, the Zionist entity. We know who is the Zionist entity. Now, there, this city, the city of Tel Aviv, is known to be the capital of these type of intercourses among the world. And they have legalized those type of marriages, like maybe in the 70s and 60s. And their prime minister each year swims in the Dead Sea, there, in the occupied lands of Palestine. Isn't it worshipping the same thing and doing the same thing? Those people advocates for peace. They're doing the same thing that Namrud did. Killing and being arrogant. <clears throat> In fact, Christians and Jews and those Zion, the Zionist entity specifically, what do they believe in their corrupted scripts in the Torah, the corrupted Torah? They're the one who says that uh, Nuh has cursed the descendants of Ham, thus the descendants of Ham are slaves for the descendants of Yafith and Sam. Which is wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never advocates for slavery. He's against slavery. Why do they say that? Because they say we are the chosen people. Now in Islam, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from, the, from Sam comes Ibrahim and Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, and Arabic and the Arab language and we have those wonderful people who learned from the Zionist entity the language of Arab nationalism, of nationalism. You know, the, the Quran is in Arabic. Our Prophet is in Ara he speaks Arabic. He's Arab. So the Arabs are the, people's, uh, the chosen people. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the Quran is in Arabic, but, but for us as Arabs, this is even more responsibility. Because now we have to teach non-Arabs the Quran. So 
Arabs who speak Arabic and they don't understand the Quran. And if they, don't, if they understand the Quran, they don't teach the Quran, their punishment is double. The Muslim who does not understand Arabic and does not teach is double. So don't laugh too much and don't be happy too much. I'm Arab and I'm... A, no, you, you, you want to be an Arab, a true Arab, you teach others who don't speak Arabic, Arabic to, to learn the Quran. You teach them the Quran. You teach them their religion. And subhanallah, a lot of those who are non-Arabs are way better than Arabs. Subhanallah. Salman al-Farisi, he was a Persian Sahabi. So in Medina, they would tell him, oh, you're Persian, you're Persian. We're Arabs. The Quran is in Arabic. So the Prophet Sallallahu says uh, to the, his companions, come over. And he says to Salman, come over. And he tells his companions, Salman minna ahl al-bayt. Salman is part of us. He's part of my family. He's from ahl al-bayt, Banu Hashim. And he's Persian. And he says he's minna ahl al-bayt. There are a lot of Hashemites, a lot of people who descend from Banu Hashim, from the Prophet Sallallahu that does not mean anything. There are Hashemites who drink alcohol. And they, some of them, they play poker. And they do a lot of mubiqat. Some of them even lift Islam. That does not mean anything. There are people who descend from uh, uh, Abi Jahl, or not Abi Jahl, uh, Abu, Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab. You know who's Abu Lahab? Tabbat yada Abi Lahab. His son became Muslim. There are people who descend from him and he, they're way better than the people who descended from Ali. I'm not saying that they're better, but I'm saying some people, they're way be, they were be, they are way better. For instance, in Syria, there are uh, some Kurdish sheikh we have. He's Kurdish, he's not Arab. He's way better than millions of Arabs with, with their knowledge and uh, subhanAllah and their Quran. We have uh, in Syria, there is a sheikh, a qira'a sheikh, recitation sheikh. Uh, he's from the family of Al-Kurdi. He's Kurdish. Very famous sheikh. Sheikh Al-Kurdi. That's his name. He taught a sheikh Ayman Suwayd. Sheikh Ayman Suwayd. Sheikh Ayman Suwayd is a very famous reciter in our era. And uh, he, would, he would be considered sheikh al qurra So people who would learn tajweed or qira'a, they would go to him. So that Kurdish man taught this Arab guy. So it does not mean anything. You're Arab, you're Israelite, you're... The creed is the thing that establishes the relationships. If you follow Allah, لا فرق لعربين على عجمي إلا بالتقوى بالتقوى So inshallah, let's move really fast. So inshallah, <laughs> just give me one second. All right, so after this happened, there is uh, also a small uh, fitna uh, in, in the Torah and Christianity they do. They say that after this incident happened, Lut alayhi salam, when he left his city, he was left with his two daughters. Now what do they say, how can, how can you follow this religion, the Judaism and Christianism? How can you not say it's corrupted? They say Lut became drunk. His two daughters gave him alcohol and he became drunk and he committed intercourse adultery with his two daughters. This is even more disgusting. <laughs> and from, from them, Lut bore grandchildren, waliyadu billah, and they would become the Mu'abis. Why do they say that? Because they're the chosen people. They want to show you that, oh, see, the, the, these people are disgusting. They, they came from a disgusting act, but we are pure. And this is untrue, completely. Uh, the two daughters of uh, Lut, they got married to, uh, in the tribe of Ibrahim, to another two men, and from them, they come the Mu'abis and other nations. Not from Lut, So I don't think we have much time left for, to discuss what happened with Ismail. After that, we don't have much time. Okay, so inshallah, we, we, let's stop here. So, uh, we stopped at Lut leaving, and then after that, let's just say this, because it's just quick, Lut came back to Canaan. After he and Ibrahim met in Damascus, they came back to Canaan. And next time, let's talk about what Ibrahim did to Ismail. He met with Ismail, we're going to talk about Ismail in depth, 
and maybe the death of Ibrahim and Hajar. Inshallah. Uh, any any questions? Is there anybody anybody has any questions? No questions. Inshallah. Let's do dua. Okay. Allahum hadina fi man hadait, wa afina fi man afait, wa tawallana fi man tawallait, wa barik nana fi ma aatait, wa qina wasrif anna sharra ma qadait. إنك تقضي بالحق وإنه لا يقضى عليك وإنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقواتنا أبدا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا ولا تسلط علينا من لا يرحمنا يا رحم الرحمين يا أكرم الأكرمين سبحانك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة جزاكم الله خيرا and I'm really sorry I took